they took her. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. Because now, I will snatch every motherfucker birthday. It really was that at some social gathering, Ovitz, super agent at the time, Simmel running Warner Brothers, they got together and said, wouldn't it be nice to just plug in an Errol Flynn type and uh, call Couldn't it we day? create? Couldn't we create, we create a movie it? star? Yeah. You know, because they could see that this sort of yeah. fair was selling you know and so and the skull movies did really good business they did and they were produced for a, a number that everyone was comfortable with yeah. but my question and this is before i mean you probably worked with seagal in the at that time uh, this is before i worked with him but now the lore that became the seagal mysticism uh and i've got a i've got a question that came to us that i'm going to ask you and i'm going to answer too but was that created by Warner Brothers or was that Seagal the, the, with his black ops community CIA background um, that wasn't ever very convincing? I don't think for any of us, but I don't know. So I don't think Warner Brothers did that. I think I think they went along with it. I think it was sort of Stevens idea, you know, to go along with all that stuff. They now, did. Do think, do, they, not to, I mean, they no, did go, above the law. Right? Is that his first thing above the law? Right. But do you think that they concocted that like in a over dinner or do you think Seagal came with that as part of his quote unquote reputation and they it's, go we can use that I don't think or, uh, no I I don't think they created that I I have to think that Steven it's what like Simmel just says let's not look at that I, I too think closely, I or? think Terry no 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 I I think Terry and Bob and Michael Ovitz probably could have come up with a different a better piece of bullshit than that you know, that's a great point. They could have. So that means yeah. this must have been Steven. <laughs> you know, because right? those guys are the architects of really well crafted BS. Yeah. Like, like you don't even yeah. know it's BS. Like they yeah. can sell you anything. Yeah. So that that's right. So, but I, it's just kind of curious because you think at some point they go, do you think he really did work for the black ops community? You think at some point it would come up and they go, ah, just don't, yeah, never mind. Let's just. Leave it for him to work it out on the Arsenio I, show. I don't think they ever seriously believed it, but I don't. I, I wasn't there. I wasn't part of those. And and when I was given this, uh, when I was told this story, it was like, you know, I, I don't know that I believe it, but it sure make it. It would make sense because I don't know I, whoever heard of Stephen Skull doing anything before above the law. I mean, usually right. movie stars are pulled have done something. They've done something in the theater. They've done, like Stephen never even did Aikido um, competitively. Like Chuck Norris, Chuck Norris was a bona fide kick-ass right. guy, right? Steve, I, I'm not aware that Stephen was ever that, you know. So, and it's but it's not my sort of thing either, and that's not right. my kind of movie. Like when Above the Law, I did not run to the movie theater to see Above the Law. I wasn't working at Warner's then. But I did not go running to go see that movie. But I became aware of it because Siskel and Ebert were talking about this new star, you know, who does this and that and and all this. And then there was and then Rod Lurie was doing all those stories in um, L.A. Magazine, I think, right? where he was right. and he was calling him fat boy before he was really I mean, he was always jowly. But he started to gain the weight, I think, before right before Under Siege, because they hit him under the apron on there. And Rod Lurie kept calling him Fat Boy and stuff. And and these are real pot boiler scripts that, you know, it was it just it was style over substance, you know. So, but it was, you know, exploitation movies. That's that's right, what they were, Stephen they were. was doing. I mean, there, and there's nothing wrong with that. The but, above the law angle in those early days was you're right. There was no track record. He had no trajectory that we could detect prior to that arrival. Right. He just, boom, he's in this movie. Right. And, and with, and with they him created comes... this whole persona about him beyond, beyond the black ops, CIA bullshitty mm -hmm. sort of stuff. You know, they created this whole thing about how he was an Italian from Brooklyn. Okay. When he was really Jewish from Detroit, Okay, right. I mean that I thought was hilarious too, and and I don't think it was Rod Lurie who wrote about that. I think it somebody at Warner Brothers was talking about it. 
about so, just the ridiculousness of this whole thing that they created. You know, I'm not a, I'm not necessarily a fan of name calling, and I know Rob Laurie loved to call them names. And I mean, look, he's probably yeah. earned an insult or two. But um, you, you were insinuating that that was right around the time when we they, they did the Seagal. They, we had to use the Seagal Chin Light. The, yeah, the Chin Light came and, after Under Siege. Yeah. And the um the crew well, on we on the Glimmer Man dailies. started referring We'd watch to. Them. I remember Rob Gromick came into dailies. Now Rob was not the executive on on those movies. He was he was doing the Kevin Costner stuff. Um, but I remember Rob was in dailies one day, and and it's like he's talking to the screen. Yeah. Stephen, you're spending too much time at the craft service table. <laughs> you don't talk to me about my time. <laughs> And then yeah, if, and then they put the they put the little twinkle light. Usually yeah. those lights would go above the lens, you know. This is and they would highlight an actress's eyes or something, mm. you know. That was the idea was to get someone's eyes to sparkle and they but they were doing it under the lens to kind of fill in this area so that you wouldn't see the double chin. You know. So you know, it's interesting, right? Because um so Seagal, uh he first of all on the Glamour Man, right? Again, that was right before I started working with him. The crew called him the Girdle Man, you know? Yeah. But um, he was really good. I mean, what's what's interesting about this guy is the opportunity was such a rarity for him, and he seemed to completely dismantle it and botch it for himself with this weird sort of abstract point of view of himself that robbed him of any sort of likability. But when he was on the stage at Warner Brothers, he was he would go out and talk to the tours. Yes, he would. Yeah, he would go. He would go engage with like when the he people felt who... when he felt like being noticed. He would. Yeah. He would put a folding chair next to the elephant doors and sit there right. with a newspaper. And then tourists would come by and they go, "Oh my God, there's Stephen Skull. Hey, Stephen." Right. He'd get up and he'd talk to them. You know. And yeah. then um, and then days when he didn't want to engage, he would be locked away in his trailer or something like that. Why no one has made this or put this in a movie is beyond me because it's so funny. You can see him doing like the Aikido strikes right outside the doors and waiting for the tram to show up <laughs> and arrive. But, you know, the thing. So he I, never had saw, this... I never saw him doing that. I always saw him sitting down reading a newspaper like he was nonchalantly getting catching some rays or something, right. you know, <laughs> and there was something. And as if he could read. Right. That was the other thing. Right. Just oh, to prove he on. could actually. I know. OK, I'm sorry. <laughs> Your road to redemption is paved with tombstones. No quarter, kill all masters. Go to no quarter, kill all masters.com. Rated R.